say, an overview of environmental hazards and exposure risks among unsheltered people experiencing homelessness. Uh, welcome. See you. And um, this is my project examining the environmental exposures um, and exposure risks um, presented to unsheltered people experiencing homelessness. Over the course of the last year, I have been privileged enough to participate in um, outreach service and research um, into the homeless encampment populations in the state of Washington and Northern California. Um, this project is born directly from my experiences while in the field. So first, when we talk about um, homelessness, we have to acknowledge the difference of experience. Um, so technically, homelessness is more of an umbrella term, and it encompasses two different arms of experience. The first being sheltered homelessness. Um, and in this arm, we see individuals that um, have the most protection from the natural elements. These are individuals that may be staying with friends or family or finding different um, living situations to stay in each night. Um, this would also count as like a form of hidden homelessness. Um, and when we move down to the next rung of sheltered homelessness, we see individuals that are staying um, in a shelter or in um, transitional living facilities. In this case, we see uh, that individuals are presented a safe place to sleep at night. However, it is not at all a permanent solution, and um, uh, it does provide a little bit more protection from the natural elements than, say, our second rung of homelessness, which would be the unsheltered individuals. These are individuals that are living mostly or completely outdoors. They may be spending their nights and days um, in a car, in an RV, in a tent, or just completely out in the open. Um, so one, one night in January every year, the US government sends people out to count the number of individuals that are staying in homeless shelters and that are living outdoors. Um, this is called the point in time count. Uh, the last point in time count that included sheltered and unsheltered individuals took place on a single night in January 2020. Um, the results of that study were that there were approximately a total of 580,000 individuals experiencing some form of homelessness throughout the United States. To put that into perspective, that number is more than the total population of human beings living in the entire state of Wyoming as of the 2021 U.S. Census. Um, nearly 40% of all the individuals that were counted in this homelessness um, outreach uh, point in time study, were 40% of them were experiencing unsheltered homelessness. So the objective of this project was to investigate the current knowledge and recent peer-reviewed literature on uh, the environmental hazards and exposure risk faced by unsheltered individuals. Um, by conducting a literature review, I was looking to address four main questions. The first being, what does the current peer-reviewed literature say about environmental hazards of the unsheltered individuals? Uh, the second, which environmental hazards present the greatest ex exposure risk among unsheltered individuals living outdoors? The third was, what are the sources and pathways of exposure? And the fourth was, what gaps are present in the current literature? So it's extremely important that we carry out um, research on the homeless population, especially the um, unsheltered. Uh, di division. Um, first of all, there's a lack of research on this population already. Um, even within research articles that investigate homelessness, uh, the articles themselves don't always clearly uh, differentiate whether the homeless population they're studying is sheltered or unsheltered. 
Um, and um, this could be because collecting data on the homeless population itself can be incredibly difficult. Even the nation's largest effort to count individuals with the point in time count um, is not accurate because it does not capture every individual experiencing homelessness. Second, we see the number of homeless individuals is continued to grow. It is continuing to grow. Um, if you look here on the chart, you can see that the number of um, homeless individuals is on an upward trend just between 2016 and 2020, and that in the last year, the number of unsheltered individuals has actually surpassed the number of sheltered individuals. And um, if we take a look at this graph here, we can actually see the rate of growth um, for uh, shelter, sheltered individuals, uh, sheltered and unsheltered homeless individuals. And if you look here, you can see that unsheltered individuals have had the highest rate of growth just between 2019 and 2020 alone. And finally, we have to acknowledge climate change as a continued problem. Um, for, the for the foreseeable future, we can expect to have um, unpredictable and extreme weather events happening um, that are going to heavily impact people's ability to stay housed and survive when they become unhoused. So um, the environmental exposures that I searched for fell into four different categories. Uh, first, I looked for uh, chemical exposures, um, per, uh, specifically within nearby surface water, ambient air, or in the soil. Um, second, I looked for any biological exposures. Um, this would be by way of um, sewage, sanitation, or interaction with pests. Uh, third, I looked at uh, physical environmental exposures. So these would be, these would consist of exposures to noise, light, or the built environment itself. And fourth, I looked at extreme weather events, and I limited this to extreme hot and extreme cold temperature events. So I searched uh, all of PubMed, and initially I found 413 articles. Um, after reading through them, I came to a total of four articles that met my specific inclusion criteria and specifically referenced unsheltered homelessness. So, um, of these four articles, two of them talked about chemical exposures, and these were in the form of nearby surface water, uh, toxic content toxic contaminants in nearby surface water and in ambient air. Um, a third article discussed uh, phys physical exposure with um, it being the built environment itself, uh, leading to more falls amongst the unsheltered population. And then the fourth article discussed biological exposures by way of insufficient sanitation structures. Because my results were so limited and did not meet all of um, the categories I sought to answer, I went ahead and expanded my search results to include any environmental exposures that might be generalizable to the unsheltered population. And here we see um, a chart that dives a little deeper into some of the other exposures that I didn't find articles related to my population. So although PubMed is an incredibly vast database, um, it is incredibly astonishing that I was only able to find four articles that met my criteria that spoke specifically about unsheltered individuals, individuals living in encampments, um, and, and their um, exposure to the natural world. Um, so I would like to talk a little bit about my limitations 
and just say that um, because I chose to focus specifically on unsheltered homeless individuals, um, I found very few articles. Um, I believe that this could be because it's extremely hard to study the homeless population. Um, and also, even within articles that discussed homelessness, uh, they, there was no standardized way of differentiating between those that are living in shelters, staying with friends, or those that are sleeping completely out in the open. Um, and then fourth, all estimates of homelessness are not accurate. Um, this is because it's very easy to miss individuals that are experiencing homelessness and because of the um, ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. So my recommendations. Um, first off, I recommend that we continue to carry out more studies of the environmental exposures um, and that we do so in different regions across North America um, to capture different seasonal exposures. Um, and that when we write these articles, we make sure to differentiate, um, is this a population that is sheltered or unsheltered? My second recommendation is that policymakers continue to create and support housing first initiatives so that we can get people housed and um, accommodate their needs. Um, and third, and maybe most important, I recommend that we employ more people with lived experience um, to oversee research and policy ideas. I would like to thank the University of California Berkeley School of Public Health um, and in particular, all my friends in the 2021 and 2022 cohorts. Um, I'd like to thank my, my mentor and advisor, Professor Jay Graham. And um, I also, I owe a ton of gratitude to the people in these communities that invited me in and shared with me what their lives are like. And with that, thank you. Um, so, I, are you talking about like, a, what were my concerns about the soil in particular? So, when you're living out in the open, they, you're highly, highly susceptible to whatever contaminants are in the air or that are brought onto the premises, either by pollution um, that, that you are contributing or that others are contributing or um, that is carried onto your location. So, I wanted to take a look because when you go out into encampments and things, you'll see that the ground is not the cleanest. Um, and so I wanted to see if I could find any articles that talked about what contaminants are on the soil, because you have individuals that are sometimes sleeping directly on that ground. I guess, oh. go ahead. I guess too, were there any studies looking at proximity to like, hazard sites or like brownfields or like these toxic places in relation to housing encampments? Um, not that I found. But from the chat, um, let's see, you mentioned that it's challenging to study the homeless population. Could you share more about what some of those challenges are and ways to address them? Yes, so um, it's very, very easy to miss unhoused individuals in particular um, for very many reasons. They may hide when you come around to count them or even give them services. I mean, if you can think about it, these are individuals that are out there doing whatever it takes just to survive. Mm -hmm. And so these are individuals that may not be in the right set of mind. These are individuals that may have criminal histories. These, these are individuals that may be hiding children that they don't want to be separated from. Um, and so I think that to better capture individuals, we have to kind of 
we have to build better relationships within their communities. We have to educate them and let them know that their children won't be taken away just because we come around and identify them. That they won't be put in prison just because they may be on drugs or using drugs or, or selling things just to survive. All right, let's thank Bianca.